Few historical moments of the last century are as powerful or as visceral as the assassination of American President John F. Kennedy. It may be difficult to imagine in these hardened political times, but JFK was much more than a mere politician. He was a star, a beacon of hope for the future. Of course, all that was shattered when he was gunned down in Dallas, Texas. As we approach the 50th anniversary of that shocking day, anyone old enough will no doubt recall that moment with vivid clarity. But none more so than the bodyguard who still can't forgive himself for failing to save the president's life. And a warning, in our story you'll see the full unedited vision of the moment JFK was killed. November the 22nd, 1963, and America's nightmare on Elm Street is about to begin. The assassination of President John F. Kennedy in Dallas, Texas. And we got to about this point on Elm Street, and the first shot rang out. And you were I, sitting where the president was sitting? I'm sitting where the president was sitting. I'm driving down the most painful of memory lanes with former Secret Service agent Clint Hill. I saw the president move violently to his left and I knew something was wrong. He grabbed at his throat. A lone gunman fires three shots in six seconds and mortally wounds the most dashing president the United States has ever known. Clint Hill is the bodyguard climbing onto the back of the Kennedy limousine. 50 years on, he still hasn't forgiven himself for not saving the president's life. There's that feeling in my gut that I should have gotten there in time. I should have been able to get up there and I should have taken that third shot myself. You should have taken the bullet for the president. That's what I think. That was your job. That's exactly it. That was my job. <sighs> That's why I have that sense of guilt, failure, because I wasn't able to get there in time. So help you God. So help me God. It all began three years earlier with so much promise. A charismatic young president, a war hero with a glamorous wife and a young family, and a wonderful way with words. And so, my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. The Kennedy White House was an all too brief period of political enchantment that came to be forever known as Camelot. It was a whole new adventure for uh, we in the Secret Service, as well as for all the people in the United States. That's right. It was a triumph of the 60s, really, wasn't it? The coming to power of young people. It was, as the president said in his inaugural address, uh, it's a new generation. At the time, Clint Hill was an ambitious young Secret Service agent desperate to stay on the presidential detail, only to be bitterly disappointed when told he would be looking after the president's wife. I didn't want to be assigned to Mrs. Kennedy. I had been with President Eisenhower, and I had seen how first ladies previously had operated. They weren't terribly excited. No, they weren't, and I didn't want any part of that. I wanted to be where the action was, and that was always, in the past, had been with the president of the United States. Clint Hill, along with the rest of the world, quickly learned Jackie Kennedy was an entirely different kind of first lady. She was a wonderful, elegant, uh, considerate lady. Beautiful. Classy. Beautiful. And you called her? Mrs. Kennedy. And, and she called you? Mr. Hill. And that never varied. Clint Hill was not only Jackie Kennedy's bodyguard, but her most trusted ally. She spent more time with him than with any other person, including the president. We would spend the summers in Cape Cod and then perhaps go to Europe for a period of time. Uh, spent uh, Christmas and New Year's and Easter in Palm Beach, Florida. You lived the high life, young man. I lived the high life, but I was living it on $12 a day. <laughs> the president brought his wife home after the death. In November 1963, Jackie was recovering from the death of her newborn son, Patrick. Then there is Mrs. Kennedy. She decided to travel to Texas with the president to help sway votes 
in what would be a tough upcoming presidential election. It was a huge event for the Lone Star State and a security nightmare for Clint Hill and the rest of the Secret Service. A pressing crowd, open windows in every building and the president's instructions to the agents to stay well back from his open car. Because he didn't want it to appear there was anything between himself and the people who were there to see him. How he, did you feel about that? Well, we all felt that we'd be better off with someone on the car. But we knew that that was his preference and uh, we thought we could manage the situation without being there. Despite this presidential wish, Clint did ride on the Kennedy car for some of the way. Such was the crush of the crowd. But coming to the end of the route through Dallas, he relaxed and hopped back onto the following vehicle. And then we just went one block, and then we turned left onto Elm Street. And that put us right in front of the Texas School Book Depository. On the corner of Houston and Elm, a lone gunman named Lee Harvey Oswald was about to start shooting from the sixth floor of the Texas School Book Depository. I saw the president grab at his throat, and he moved to his left violently, and I knew something was wrong. And so I jumped from the follow-up car, ran toward the presidential vehicle with the idea of getting on top of the rear of the car to form a protective barrier behind President and Mrs. Kennedy to prevent any further damage from being done. As I got close to the car, a third shot was fired and it hit the president in the head. It entered the rear of the president's head and it exited the upper right quadrant of the skull. And blood and brain matter and bone fragments came out of the wound, came over the back of the car, over Mrs. Kennedy, and on myself. Not knowing how many shots would be fired, or how many shooters there were for that matter, Clint Hill desperately tries to get up on the president's car. While I was doing that, Mrs. Kennedy came out in the trunk. She was trying to grab some of the material that came off the president's so head. she's hanging over the back of the car? She's right up on the back of the car. And she didn't know I was there. And I finally got up there and I got a hold of her and put her in the back seat. And when I did that, the president's body fell off to its left into her lap. His head was on her lap and the right side of his face was up. I could see his eyes were fixed and I considered it a fatal wound. And I turned and I gave a thumbs down to the other agents in the car immediately behind, called the follow-up car. Something has happened in the motor This appalling act of terrorism happened right in front of Bill and Gail Newman and their young sons. We were looking at the car and the first two shots rang out. It was a bang, bang like that. What did you think at that moment? I thought it was firecrackers. I'd never been around gunfire and, you know, didn't didn't know what it would sound like, but when the car got directly in front of us, uh, that third shot rang out, and you could see just bits of flesh flying up in the air and so, sort of white matter coming out of his head. And I mean, it just, it was so shocking. The president was hit in the head. After racing to Parkland Hospital and helping to carry the president inside, Clint Hill phoned Washington. I was trying to explain to my boss in Washington what had happened, and the operator cut in and said, uh, Mr. Hill, the Attorney General wants to talk to you. The Attorney General being Robert Kennedy, the President's brother. That's a difficult moment. How do you tell his brother? Well, that was the day? problem. He said, what's going on down there? Because he really didn't know. And so I explained what the situation was. And then he said, well, how bad is it? I did not want to tell him that his brother was dead. So I simply said, well, it's as bad as it can get. That was the truth. And with that, he hung up the phone. So then at one o'clock, Dallas time, doctors came out and said, the president has died. The president is dead. From Dallas, Texas, the flash, apparently official, 
President Kennedy died at 1 p.m. Central Standard Time, 2 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, some 38 minutes ago. I was in the other side of the world. I was a kid in Tasmania, a school kid, and it was early in the morning. I remember vividly switching on a blue HMV valve radio receiver, and as the valves warmed up, slowly the voices came in and told me that the president had been shot. I ran down the corridor, I remember, to alert a largely disbelieving household. But as we gathered round television and radio, it soon became apparent that that, in fact, was the awful truth. That somehow the history of the world had been violently changed and our own lives, in a way, would never be quite the same again. I think we lost our innocence. Uh, it was just a terrible thing to happen. And and it, it affected everybody. The funeral of JFK was held on the 25th of November, 1963. It was the third birthday of his young son, John, who touchingly saluted the father he would never know. It is the saddest, one of the saddest images of the century, isn't it? And standing there that day, generals, to touch to privates, all had a tear in their eye when they saw this young boy salute their father. I think everybody did around the world. To Dallas, Texas. As for the gunman Lee Dallas, Harvey Texas, Oswald, no one would learn why he shot the president. Yeah, there is Lee Oswald. Oswald was infamously gunned down by local nightclub owner Jack Ruby in the Dallas police station. Man with a gun, it's absolute panic. But despite all the conspiracy theories, there has never been any credible evidence to suggest anything other than that Oswald acted alone. Certainly, that's what Clint Hill believes. Okay, Charlie, this is uh, it's called a sniper's perch. This is where Lee Harvey Oswald secluded himself or put himself in a position to observe what was going on in the motorcade. It took Clint Hill a long time to come to terms with the events of that day. Despite being awarded for his bravery, he battled depression and alcoholism for years after retiring from the service. Only recently has he been writing and talking about the assassination, which he says has been hugely therapeutic for the lingering guilt. I, uh, I still have that sense that I should have been able to do just enough to get there in time, but you can't go faster than the speeding bullet. And you can't turn back time. No, you cannot. It is said the death of President Kennedy spelled the end of America's age of innocence. Perhaps that's too simple and romantic a view, but it is a reflection of the mark one man and his beautiful wife left on the world and left in particular on a long retired but ever loyal Secret Service agent. I do have some wonderful memories. Uh, they're not all obliterated by the bad ones. No, there are more wonderful memories than there are bad memories. That's the only right. problem is the one real bad memory is a horrific one. Hello, I'm Tara Brown. Thanks for watching 60 Minutes Australia. Subscribe to our channel now for brand new stories and exclusive clips every week. And don't miss out on our Extra Minutes segments and full episodes of 60 Minutes on 9now.com.au and the 9now app.